I am uh, your moderator for today. I'm Michael Vern. I'm the president and owner of the Vern Collection of Japanese Art, established in 1953. It's 70 years old. Um, my parents lived in Japan back in 1953 and 54. Uh, when my dad was a doctor in the U.S. Navy, and this began as a private collection of old Japanese prints and paintings that were on loan to the Metropolitan Museum, the Cleveland Museum, and the Fog at Harvard. They selected me as the moderator uh, because I flunked kindergarten. And uh, with that, I'm gonna introduce you um, to these three distinguished um, print dealers and print aficionados um, and printers. Uh, the first uh, person uh, is Kimberly Henriksen. Uh, and uh, she can, uh, after I introduce everybody, you guys can tell you your story about uh, a little bit about who you are. Um, this is Mark Chabot, and this is my colleague Allison Tolman, who's one of the foremost contemporary Japanese print dealers in the world. And uh, um, this is going to be like a 12 step program. If you, go, if you talk too long, I'm going to hit my knee. <laughs> and uh, with that, Kimberly, why don't you say a few things about yourself? Okay. So um, I'm currently the executive director at the Center for Contemporary Printmaking in Norwalk, Connecticut. Um, I am not a printmaker. I studied art history, and I would say I came to the Center for Contemporary Printmaking as a result of my involvement with the Print Club of New York, which is a collector's group. Um, and I've been involved with that organization for about 12 to 13 years. It kind of blurs after a while. Uh, but I've been president and am now membership chair uh, but it was through a, a tour of CCP for members that I found out about it and realized how wonderful an organization it was. So I am straddling both the print collector space as well as uh, like the print making um, and active space with artists. And um, personally, that's a wonderful place to be. And I love the artists that come through. I love the work that I do. Um, and it gets me a chance to buy more art. <laughs> so um, yes, I have a, a big collection at home and my expectation is that over the years, it's going to continue to increase and- um, I can vouch for I, I, just I, <laughs> Yes. <laughs> so that's the collecting part of my life. So I'll pass it on to Mark. Um, well, I'm Mark Chabot. I've been an artist all my life and uh, in 1990, January 1st, I founded Mark Chabot Fine Arts because I too had the collecting bug and I realized that I wanted to share my passion and the joy I got from printmaking um, with others. And uh, it also would help, help me justify my proclivity for acquiring prints. So um, uh, I also have a scholarly interest in, in printmaking. Although I don't have a long list of periodicals uh, to my credit yet, um, I, there are some. Uh, I've been curator of the Natalie Van Bleck collection at Flanders Nature Center and Land Trust in Woodbury, Connecticut. Uh, she was a modernist painter, made a handful of prints after studying with Max Weber, and they're wonderful. Um, and uh, I've I've taught in various art organizations through the years, and I've continued to deal and collect prints, and I've continued to occasionally teach printmaking and make prints as well. I'm primarily a draftsman. I didn't really turn into a painter. Um, but I also have a, a very strong interest in reviving the career of forgotten artists. I'm not alone in this, but there need to be more people doing this because we are constantly losing our legacy, our graphic legacy, to indifference and wrong place, wrong time kind of scenarios where an artist's entire life production is thrown in the dumpster because the next generation doesn't care or some bill didn't get paid or something like that. So um, I have some thoughts about that, but I'll wait for it. So, Allison. Hi. I'm Allison Tolman, and I'm delighted to be here with Kim and Mark and Michael. Like Michael, I too am a second generation dealer of contemporary Japanese prints, but I'm also a collector, and I'm a second 
generation collector as well, because my parents st certainly started that trend. I have felt for a long time that the world of contemporary Japanese prints is really under known. Michael and I, I think, can talk about that a lot. And I certainly understand Mark's position about wanting to revive the careers of people, well, certainly revive the knowledge of right. people's careers who have worked so tirelessly. As you know, in printmaking, it's all about the hand of the artist. And for, to just disregard people who have put so much effort, as Mark said, you see, you see people's Maybe it's not. Maybe it's not. It's not so much indifference. It's just lack of knowledge that people don't know, especially in this country, what printmaking is. You can do, as a dealer, I do many print fairs, and just to go to other countries and see the importance to which printmaking is attached. And in this country, we really don't know as much as we should about printmaking. And I think that all of us on this panel are working as hard as we can to make people know more about prints. All right, so the first question I have is for Kimberly. Okay, I, I wrote this while drinking a bourbon. Um, <laughs> why did they make a girl who grew up in Amish country two feet down rivers uh, and from a rural area that had the best ice cream? Um, why did they make you the executive director of the CCD and uh, how did it affect the art? And I hope they thought it was a good idea. <laughs> um, so yeah, my route to coming to the Center for Contemporary Printmaking um, was, I mean, as a nonprofit, I think not unusual. Um, I was pulled in um, stage by stage uh, because, as I, as I mentioned, I'd come to CCP as a member of the Print Club of New York, and I got a tour. And my husband and I had moved out of New York City to Connecticut, and I thought, Oh, this is so close to home. How amazing. I have this amazing print center 15 to 20 minutes from my house. So I started attending events, coming to exhibitions, going to the fundraiser, and then through getting to know people there, they're like, oh, you know, you're really interested. And I studied art history. I, I worked, actually, I worked at a gallery in the Fuller Building on 57th and Madison back when it used to have art galleries. In it, and Thursday nights were great because you could run the building up and down the elevator and go to all sorts of openings. Um, so I had a strong background, and it mattered to me what they were doing there. So um, I got pulled into some committees, and then I got pulled onto the board. And then from being on the board, there was about to be a leadership change, and I threw my hat into the ring thinking, I could do that. <laughs> I'd love to try if you, you know, if, if you're willing to consider me. And um, they were very positive, the board, the rest of the board, about my coming into the role. Um, and so it was the first time I'd been an executive director, and I, I was very concerned about whether I was going to make a good show of it, because the thing is, like, I do care about the artists. I do care about what they do, the space, the offerings for the community, the quality of the exhibitions. Like it, it has meaning to me, and especially for printmaking. This, I think, ongoing educational um, challenge that we have in trying to explain what printmaking is to other people. When it's something you care about, and it's something that is so complicated to try and explain to people, you want to find every way that you can to try and bring a community in to some consideration and some love of it, and so I hoped that I could do that there. How do you explain it to them in two sentences? <sighs> you don't. <laughs> in two, I mean, in two sentences, it's, it, it's, I mean, as easy as saying, you know what a footprint is. You know, your, your mark from, from one surface to another, and that is like the very basic thought of a, of a that people can associate with. Um, but, but there's so much more than that. <laughs> and, and I will say having a space where we have exhibitions and we can bring the public in to look and start asking questions and explore that curiosity 
and then having the studio space at the same time, I feel very fortunate beyond what maybe some other galleries or museums might have when there's a print exhibition in that you can, you can feel the confusion when you're talking to somebody and they want to know more, but I can say, well, there's an artist working over in the etching studio, or we have the workshop going on upstairs. Why don't we come and take a look and I can show you? And they will inevitably watch and observe and think it through and then realize, that, but do you have to do that for every color? <laughs> and then you have to let it dry? Doesn't that take a long time yeah. and then it dawns on them oh oh that's what a print is and you're like yes and people study this and people practice it and practice it and practice it and what you see on the wall and particularly if you are buying and selling them there are years of, of work represented by that one print and it's not and I think there's confusion because we have printers at our desks now, and printing, um, you know, comes so much easier. Artists are maintaining those historic processes that have been left behind by the advent of faster, cheaper, um, you know, more right. profitable processes in, in business to get through and, and make things that are needed. But it's the artists who have latched onto those and say, no, like, I don't want to let those go. There's something really special about the image and the, the texture and the surface that comes out of that. And I want to keep that. That has meaning to me personally. So drawing people from the present back to the past to show them how things are done is unique for the space that I have. And I'm grateful to have it. All right. So in a piece of paper and and that dollar figure. Um, I think the people that, that do these print fairs at the top level, um, they know the artists, they, they care about them, and I think sometimes uh, too often in the art world you just see these dollar figures and you forget that there are real people behind them, whether they're selling something for $100 or a million dollars. So Allison, um, this question is for you. Um, <coughs> You grew up in Japan. What was it like living there as an American kid? And how did it affect the art you select for your gallery? What funny things happened in Japan that most American kids would not experience? Well, first of all, I don't think that most American kids grow up in Japan. So that's, <laughs> that's pretty funny from the, from the get-go. And I actually have very unusual parents who they're American, but they ended up sending their two daughters to the French Lycée in Tokyo. So I think my sister is the only person who has gone from kindergarten to 12th grade at the French school in Tokyo, which is, which is pretty amazing. Um, I think that growing up in Japan, it really did affect the way that I look at prints, especially from the artists that um, you know, we, we both represent in certain cases. There's something about the attention to detail. I mean, contemporary Japanese printmakers are world-renowned because the attention to detail, the limited editions, the, the sheer creativity is always something that people remark on, on, on any of the many, many art fairs that I do. And also, and Michael, I mean, you're, you're certainly going to agree with me, the fact that people can do all of this printing, so they're, they're creative, and then, for the most part, make the prints so accessible. I mean, you, were, you, you mentioned price. I mean, Japanese prints are usually pretty reasonable considering how much work has gone into them. And I think that that's something that our, our clients are certainly always thrilled with because, you know, we're living in an inflationary world. Everything costs so much now. And the fact that you can get an original print made by somebody for, in many cases, a few hundred dollars, is, it's, it's wonderful. It, it, it means that we can have young people start collecting in this field, which is so important. I mean, we're, of course, all dealers are incredibly grateful to all the people who are older. I think I'm supposed to say mature, who are mature, and who have been collecting for a long time, but every field needs new blood and new people to come into the field. And when I've done art fairs and people tentatively say, well, well, well how much is that? And you know, when you can say, well, you know, um, it's under a thousand dollars, people are, are so happy because it means that it's something that if they couldn't buy it right then, they can save up for it. 
that, that's not, and that, that's a, it's, it's a wonderful part of the art market in which to be, I think. All right. So Mark, um, I've done quite a few shows with you, but I've never really gotten to talk with you until you were exhausted yesterday. <laughs> and, uh, and uh, you know, a lot of people don't see that in the real art world. They, they see us in these uh, jackets and nice pants and, and uh, they don't see all the packing up and the, um, and trying to make lists of all the people that have collected from you and trying to remember everybody's name and and uh, um, and trying to get everything here safely and and then set up. But I was talking to Mark yesterday and he was telling me how he had done like three different major things yesterday uh, before the opening and. Um, but I could tell that he, he really selects his art with his heart, um, and he really cares about the artists that he represents. So you sent me a, a little email about who you are, and uh, this is what I got from it. I, I, this is the question for you. As a print dealer and printmaker, how do you select art that is different than the normal art dealer that just selects art? What is your sketching story that you referred to my sketching. That's what it said, sketching story. Well, I'll, I'll have to ruminate on, on what that was. Okay. I, I can come up with another one if I can't make that okay. connection. Just make it But, but um, uh, how do I select work? Well, it has to move me as, as an artist. It, and being moved can occur on different levels. It can occur, you know, a gut response to something like, oh my God, that was so beautiful. Or, what the hell is that? Or, or intellectually you can be intrigued by something that may be outside of your sphere of, of uh, expertise or awareness, but you find yourself drawn to it maybe because you want to understand it. So one thing I found, a, a truth for me in being involved in the world of prints is that, you know, it's kind of a, it's a metaphor for for personal relationships as we move through life. There are people that you gravitate toward immediately, other people that you say, oh my God, what a piece of work yeah. that person is, or you know, they're not very nice, or whatever it happens to be. But somehow, through the wisdom of accumulated life experience and finding more points of connection, one thing leads you to another, and you break down your own prejudices you become more inclusive, more receptive, more open-minded. You, you are expanded. Who you are is enriched and expanded by all these spheres of influence and experience that you see. So that's more of a general observation, but it okay. certainly relates to how I choose. The other thing is, as I said from the get-go, uh, looking at things or becoming aware of artists whose work has not really been seen. And, but it still has to have all the things that I just spoke of. And that I say, I've got to do something for this person. You know, I mean, I should be doing stuff for myself because I'm a printmaker and artist, but I've so, and I continue to be, but I've laid that aside and compartmentalized that a little bit to try and give back to some of these artists I encounter, or to try and understand what I'm looking at and how it plugs into our culture, our greater culture, or how it expands it in a, in a way that I was never, I had never experienced personally before. So is that enough of an answer? Does that's, that? That's it. That <laughs> after I, I'm gonna tell you a little bit about myself, but then I want you to think about whatever you emailed the me story. at around midnight, yes. I don't know. Um, at any rate, uh, my background is a lot different than, than most people in the art world. Uh, my, uh, my second grade uh, art teacher uh, looked like the Wicked Witch and she told me I'd never do anything in art. When she came over for lunch. Uh, you had to do that for your teachers back then. But, uh, but at any rate, uh, what, I, what I learned uh, from my mom, when my parents lived in Japan, they didn't have very much money. They're, my dad was a low-level lieutenant in the Navy and U.S. Navy, and they began by collecting a pair of Japanese scrolls for $15 each, just because they liked them. And uh, those were the ones on loan to the Met. And so my, my mom started this 
Uh, I don't know why I get emotional at the, at, the, at, the, at, the, at, uh, at this point. 68, you can't control it. But at any rate, um, who started this 70 years ago? She always taught me to, to teach, uh, uh, to, to look at art with my, with my eye and my heart. And so everything I select for the gallery, um, a lot of these people that I that I introduced in uh, the world of Japanese prints, um, a lot of people didn't know about them. Um, and I, I learned how to tell these stories from Allison's dad. Um, he was the first guy that I ever saw entertaining in in the world of, uh, of contemporary Japanese prints or Japanese prints. Usually, you know, you're ready to walk out the room when people start talking about this stuff and. And he was, he was such a character and so knowledgeable, and he knew all the artists, and he knew them all personally. But, um, but at any rate, um, the way, you know, being a, being a gallery from Cleveland, um, being a gallery from Cleveland, um, it's unusual I, uh, to get into these shows. Every time I'd say I was from Cleveland, they go, I'm sorry, Mike, forget it, you know. And, uh, but I started doing shows in Los Angeles and San Francisco and Washington and Chicago, but I couldn't get into a show in New York. And about maybe 30 years ago, I heard about this show um, at the Armory called Works on Paper. And I have an MBA in marketing, and one of my marketing professors said, the key to parts of success is to be the first one to do something. And so I wrote this letter to this guy, Sanford Smith, the New York Times said, this is the number one works on paper show in the country. And I said, you never invited a Japanese gallery to be in the works on paper show. And I told him about the history of the collection and I didn't think I'd hear anything back. And I didn't hear anything back. And about two weeks before the show is gonna open, um, this guy calls me up and, at my gallery in Cleveland. He says, this is Sanford Smith. Do you wanna be in the works on paper show? And I thought it was one of my friends joking around. And I said, who is this? And he said, this is Sanford Smith. I said, well, yes, this is really Sanford Smith. Yes, I do. But the only reason I tell you this story is what happened afterwards. So I didn't have time to prepare for the show. I had to take, drive my mom's old station wagon with all the art in it. And I get to the armory and here are 90 of the biggest galleries in, in the world. Um, you know, they're from Paris, New York, Munich, London. And I get this little sign that says Cleveland and people are looking up, you know, what the hell is this guy doing here? And uh, at the end of the show, I had sold more art than I had ever sold. I didn't realize people paid that much. And, uh, and I had to get back to Cleveland uh, the next day. I coach. <laughs> I coach Little League for my kids until they were about 13. And I had to get back because I was the coach. And uh, so I pack everything up. Uh, I've got tens of thousands of dollars in my pocket. I'm dressed in a Brooks Brothers suit. And I asked the guards at the Army, how do you get get to the Lincoln Tunnel from here? And they said, well, you go down Park Avenue, take a right on 34th Street, you'll see signs for the Lincoln Tunnel, and you'll be fine. So I pull out on the Park Avenue, and uh, I'm thinking, like, for five minutes, Michael, you're the, the greatest, uh, one of the one of the greatest uh, art dealers in the world. And uh, I, I thought, I think to myself, was around time in the movie Bonfire, the vanities, all the time, all I've got to do is get out of New York. And <laughs> I see the sign for the Lincoln Tunnel, and I, all of a sudden I hit this big metal grate in the road, and I get a flat tire, and I, I'm mechanically dysfunctional. I get out, I get out of the car, I look, I go, it's flat, and I get back in the car because I thought somebody's gonna kill me. There's many homeless people leaning up against buildings. And, and uh, I see this guy walking down the street with his, pregnant wife and his baby, not a very rich guy. And, and I get out of the car, I said, excuse me, I said, I got a flat tire, should I call the police? He says, no, they won't come. And uh, I said, is there a gas station around here? He goes, no. And uh, so I probably got tears in my eyes. I said, what should I do? He says, well, he says, I'll help you. Where's the spare? I realize it's underneath all the art. So now all the art's sitting on the streets of New York. I think everybody's gonna start taking it. And I try to get these lug nuts off and it's been put on with one of these machine guns, and I've got like Johnston Murphy's on, I can't budge him. He gets, he says, let me do it. And he gets them loose really quickly. So I start jacking the car up, and every time I jack the car up, this family breaks out into. It's, it's because we're in a church. Um, every time I jack the car up, this family breaks out into the skin. 
and they go, thank you, Jesus, thank you. And, uh, <laughs> and the, the guy goes, he says, Michael, he says, you, you've got to thank Jesus. And I'm thinking to myself, well, I'm certainly not going to tell this guy I'm Jewish. <laughs> so I said, I'm thanking him, and I hung the on because I didn't know the words. And, um, and uh, we finished uh, getting the car, the car jacked up and the tire on, and I asked... Uh, I asked the guy, can, you, can I give you some money for helping me out? He says, no, if I can't help somebody out, it's just not right. So if you get nothing else out of this talk, I, I think that's a, a, a nice thing about New York. And uh, I asked the guy what his, I asked the guy what his name is, and he said to Jesus. Oh. Oh. Yeah. At any rate, uh, <laughs> the next question. Okay, Kimberly, back to you. <laughs> Okay, Kimberly, tell us the story of an artist that nobody knew that came from nowhere to be one of the great artists that CCP discovered. What is your magical moment in the art world or that you have experienced? That I have experienced. I mean, we have a really wonderful community of artists that come to CCP to print, both people who are members of the organization as well as artists who come from other places to come and work with our printers. Um, there is an artist there who has only started coming around in the last couple of years since the pandemic, and her name is Galley Cats. I'll put that out there, Galley Cats for the world. Um, she lives in Westport, and she studied art history, and she's been coming around, taking classes, making as much time as humanly possible to come and print, and learning like every process. She has an amazing sense of composition and color and line work and shaping plates, you know, not strictly working with the square or rectangle that we're more commonly thinking of. Um, and she has just been like a force of nature. She uh, recently, I think, had applied and was accepted to Boston Printmakers and also to Saga. And her print that was in the recent Saga show this fall, um, I will admit I was the juror and I did give her an award. But the reason I did it, even though like, I have loved her work, is that in going through the, I would say probably 200 prints that were in the exhibition as they were installed, trying to pick prize winners, I'm looking, 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 looking. And you, you get standouts, you know, and that one pops, and that one does this, and then, you know, you're you're not looking at names, you're, and also I try not to think of, you know, who they are, because over time you know people in the printmaking community, and this isn't supposed to be about who your favorites are, and you look and look and look, and it's just about that work in that moment, and I got to this one, and I looked, I'm like, wow, look at that, and then I realized, I'm like, oh, that's galleys, and and I think that's where it confirmed for me that it wasn't about her as somebody that I knew or that I had seen the work happen in the space. Genuinely, her work stands out and it is getting recognized and I am eager to see what happens over time with her because that's the sort of response I want to have, whether it's somebody I know or whether it's you know, somebody that's new to me. So keep an eye out for her. Okay. So I'm going to skip to you, Allison. Um, as the second generation in the world of contemporary Japanese prints and the daughter of the infamous Norman Tolman uh, and um, what advice would you give people collecting contemporary Japanese prints? How do you select art that is different than your dad? Well, I am the daughter of two parents both Mary and Norman Tolman. And I think that growing up with my parents was wonderful because they gave me the foundation. As you said, Michael, I mean, we we're, were lucky because we, we know the artists with whom we deal. And that's really exciting. It's very hard to give people advice. I think that just as Mark said, you have to look at art and it has to resonate with you. I mean, of course we have all we know that there are people who come into a fair with a fabric swatch and they say it has to match this shade of orange, the decorator said, <laughs> which is, you know, we always hate to hear that, but it is, it is a fact of our business. I think that people have to like 
what they're going to buy because you want them to enjoy it forever and hopefully pass it on to their family or their friends or maybe donate it to a museum or a university where other people can enjoy it. I've never once said to somebody, oh, this is a good investment because that's not how I would buy art. I, I know it's a big part of the art world, but that, that's not what I like. I would really want people to think about it. As a, as a woman, these days I'm really, really focused on promoting more women's work, more Japanese women printmakers. It's been a fact for a long time that in Japan, like, like, like everywhere else, that women were at home raising family and it's many, many of the women with whom I work say that they can't or, or won't have a family because they really want to make prints and you can't do both. And that, that's, that's hard. But somehow, some of them have managed to do it. And you know, my most famous example is Toko Shinoda, who passed away two years ago at the age of 107. And when I was 16, I had asked Shinoda-san, how come you never got married? And Shinoda-san said, oh, well, it isn't that I didn't know a lot of men. And my dad said, Allison, go make the tea now. But <laughs> she just wanted to make the point that she really needed her own time and her own life. She always said, I don't want to report to anybody. I might, you know, she was such a, a trailblazing calligrapher and painter and lithographer. But I think, I think it's, I think it's hard, but I do, I, I find myself really looking at more women now and wanting to promote their work. So Mark, the last question for you is you, you carry mainly Western American and European prints, is that uh, occasionally, uh, uh, occasionally Asian prints as well. I'm not as deeply knowledgeable, but I'm certainly moved. A few. I, uh, <laughs> um, no, uh, but at, at any rate, um, there are there are a lot of a lot of different galleries that are carrying these classic. Um, I know you carry a lot of black and white. Yes, but I also love color. Okay. Yes. At any, any rate, there are a lot of galleries um, that you compete with um, in this print world. And what, what's your specialty, and and what what makes the Chabot? gallery very, very special for people to see here today? Um, well, I, it ties into what I've already said, and that is that um, I look for work, as we all do, but I look for work um, that moves me or that surprises me and uh, makes me think or just gives me a, a feeling of delight when I look at it or troubles me but in a deeply meaningful way it can be the whole gamut of emotional and aesthetic responses it, it can be uh, you know it can be gut-wrenching to the heart it can be just joyously sensuously beautiful or incredibly subtly tactile uh, it can have just all sorts of different qualities. But one thing, I know it's, you know, everyone is supposed to have a shtick, you know. Um, and one thing that's occurred to me since I live and grew up in Connecticut, and uh, I mean, the area where I grew up, I mean, you had, in my town, you had Claire Layton, you had Yves Tongay and Kay Sage. Um, right next door in, in uh, New Preston, you had Andre Masson, my best friend, shared a driveway with Noam Gaba, a Russian constructivist sculptor. Uh, Shiel Gorky, one of my favorite artists, was in Sherman. Um, it, it's extraordinary. Hans Richter was in Southbury, you know? I mean, it's, it's just this incredible world. Calder, right next door in Roxbury. Mm -hmm. We had dinner next to the Calders in a little restaurant, which in a later permutation was run by my best friend from fifth grade and where I met my uh, you know, long time significant other. So they're, they're just, you can't get away from all these connections. So, but since I live in Connecticut, I look for artists with ties to Connecticut. Um, and I found a great number of them in, in local proximity to me. Many of them famous and many of them, nobody knows anything about them. 
and, and I have so many stories of the moment of discovery that are just so poignant to me. And I'll, I'll share one of them very, very quickly, as quickly as I'm capable. And that is, um, in my own career, in, uh, in, at the end of 99 into 2000, I was part of a three, four person show at the Mattituck Museum. And I was asked to be part of the show, and I was showing my monotypes, which were landscape caprices from imagination. And I was teaching monotype at that time as well. So um, two of the artists were a married couple, Marvin Bielek and Emily Nelligan. And uh, they both summered on Cranberry Island up in Maine for 50 years. And um, both incredible draftsmen. Emily did charcoal drawings on eight and a half by 11 rag stationery, uh, very atmospheric, um, very moody, uh, capturing the, the, you know, the damp atmosphere of Maine and the changeability of the atmosphere and the, those rugged landscape forms against the sky, luminous sky. And Marvin did these old mastery, um, incredibly precise, detailed etchings of the, the you know, washed up driftwood, the, the boulders on the shore and the evergreen forest um, up there. And they were 10, 15, 20 years older than me. They liked my work. I loved their work. I wanted to buy something by each of them, but they were so damn squirrely, I couldn't. <laughs> so fast, fast forward uh, many years, and I'm at the flea market, and there's a shoebox, there's a book dealer, appropriately enough, at this fair, and a shoebox full of postcards. So I pull one out. I, it's, a, it's of a drawing by Emily Nelligan. So I pull another one out, it's the same drawing. The, the box, they're like 100 postcards, all the same one. So then the gears get turning. It's like, why are there 100 postcards in this box? And I knew she had passed away. We had been in touch sporadically um, a, a year or two, but I hadn't heard anything about what happened to her estate. Um, so I asked the guy, I said, did you happen to uh, I, I showed with these, this artist. Did, did you happen to, to get into her estate? He said, no, but a friend of mine did. And I said, okay, are there, are there drawings and prints and plates and paper and books, you know, and all sorts of cool stuff? And he said, yeah. Um, and uh, I said, okay, um, tell your friend not to sell anything. It all has to come to me. And not that I'm, you know, the pockets are deep, but I, I was ballsy. I had to say this because I knew that otherwise, if the work was dispersed in this fashion, no one would ever know what the hell Marvin in particular had accomplished as a printmaker. They, because he didn't sign a lot of his work, it would be lost. The context for it, which it still had, would be lost. So anyway, fast forward. We managed to manifest this deal and the prominent, you know, in small installments. And then the last installment, a box full of plates. I opened the box. Uh, these are Marvin's original plates. Not all of them, but a good number. I opened the box and the plates are wrapped in the announcement from our show 20 years earlier. And my name is there right next to theirs staring back at me in this box. So, you know, it came back home. My, my genuine motivation and love and respect for the work brought the work to me. And this has happened over and over in my life. So, if anything makes me, not that that's unique, but it's certainly